Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the hour is upon us. I was taught when doing this by uh, Linda Lewis, who did this prior to my time, uh, which my time is one year, to start on time. The hour is upon us. So we will get started. Uh, we want to welcome you all this evening, uh, let you know that there will be refreshments. Uh, this is our second public lecture from our Pearson professor, our Pearson professor of distinguished professor of Swedish studies, uh, Barbro Klein. Barbro has been with us now for a little over two months. Um, and as we, as, as you know, if you're used to the northern climb, uh, the summer is short. The summer is short, summer and cool. And our stay with Barbro has also been very short, much too short. It's been a delightful couple of months. Uh, her class uh, must have enjoyed it. Here, they are here tonight, so I guess they can't get enough. Uh, and before we get started, uh, there is something to do with uh, Gustavus Adolphus, and Charlotte is going to explain that to us. Well, I was just going to say that this is an important day in America with the election, but we also noted that this is an important historical day in Sweden. November 6, 1632 was the day Gustavus Adolphus died. And uh, there are several things that are special that are, you know, places and, and universities and, and events that have been named in the honor of Gustavus Adolphus. Um, uh, we, there is a Gustavus Adolphus pastry and uh, Noni and I visited with uh, Wally. We couldn't quite find the recipe, but there will be a special treat for the refreshments. And it's in honor for of Gustavus Adolphus. Uh, and, and of all the days, I don't know if you know, but in the Swedish year, every day has a name day. Uh, most Swedish Americans are aware of that. And, and uh, November 6th is one of the few days of the year um, that have two names, Gustavus Adolphus, Gustav Adolf. It has the whole name of the king who died this day. Uh, if you have not taken one of the, uh, uh, the cherry sheets, uh, those are the cheat sheet to help you with tonight's lecture. And with no further ado, I'd like to welcome back Barbara Klein. Dear friends, I am delighted and I'm overwhelmed by your generosity and the welcoming I have felt during these past weeks. It has been wonderful and I am looking forward to the few days that are left, but I will not look forward to the final day. Um, the title of my talk tonight is slightly different from the one announced. You have it on your pink. She's reforming women, heritage making, and folk life studies in Sweden, circa 1900. What roles have women played in shaping a Swedish folk cultural heritage? What roles have they played in forming a discipline of folk life studies, discipline nowadays called ethnology? Reading ethnology textbooks and historical surveys, even very recent ones, one could easily think that they weren't there at all, at least not in the 19th century. Did they exert influence in their lifetime and were somehow forgotten later? These questions have been posed within many disciplines, yet the answers are not always similar. They are not at all always predictable. To answer the questions, we must look at the intellectual and social movements that flourished outside the universities around 1900 and the decades before. Although efforts to preserve the folk culture had begun decades long before, it was now that the museums, the archives, and other institutions were established, institutions out of which the academic discipline grew. 
Uh, I will begin with uh, about 1970, eight, 1870, <laughs> and I will speak a great deal about the years around 1900. I will alternate, alternate between generalizing statements and portraits of a few actors, not only women. Then, with the speed of lightning, I will sketch the developments from about 1910 to 2010. I can't resist doing that, even by that time you'll think, oh, she's talked a lot. But I can't resist. Uh, to a great extent, the Nordic Museum, the Nordisk Museum, if you have it on your pink sheets, will be in focus. I'm mostly doing this because of time constraints. I am well aware that significant developments took place also elsewhere in Sweden. The subject of the role of women invites comparisons between countries, and I will offer a few, but I will not present a sustained comparison. I mean, how much can you do on an election night? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not to speak of uh, Gustavus Adolphus. <laughs> uh, commemorative day. So let me say a few things about intellectual currents and about this gentleman, Arthur Hazelius, with T, not TH. Uh, the decades around 1900 vibrated with intellectual, artistic, and scholarly energies all over the Western world and beyond. This was a time of remarkable social, economic, and cultural transformations. Population increase, urbanization, emigration, primarily from Europe and to the United States, to Canada, to Australia, and other countries. This was a time of industrialization, increasing, increasing, and of modern nation building. This was also a time, of course, I've been fighting already for reforms. Temperance movements in Northern Europe, free religious movements, so-called. Feminist and feminist movements flourished in Europe and North America as women and men from the political right and the political left worked to bring about economic, social, and cultural improvements in their countries. And not least, they all worked from each, with different political standpoints. Uh, to, towards general suffrage. And what's more, the reform movements acted as catalysts for each other, and reformists were often involved in many causes at one and the same time. Now important among the movements, surprisingly important among the movements dedicated to reforms were those movements that were engaged in collecting, preserving, and presenting aspects of folk culture, aspects that were thought to be about to disappear in the onslaught of modernization. In Europe, peasants were in focus for the concerns. And in the United States, it was the traditions of native peoples that were to be collected before they were about to become extinct. That's how it was thought. In Europe and in America, national and regional archives and museums were founded. Interest groups were formed, all focusing on the preservation of the music, dance, dialects, and storytelling of various peoples. And essential to all these institutions and movements were actually artists, writers, and other intellectuals, not necessarily at all. Uh, uh, university uh, people, but all kinds of intellectuals who agreed that some traditions were more beautiful and valuable than other traditions, and that some regions, Galala in Sweden, for example, those of you who were here some time ago will know what I'm talking about, Galala in Sweden, for example, or the American Southwest, they were more interesting aesthetically and culturally than other regions. Um, the outburst in collecting folk traditions or native traditions during the last few decades of the 19th century 
actually constitute a peak in a long historical development that I find fascinating. I will not burden with it too much. But this development was nourished, for example, by German philosopher Herder, Johann Gottfried von Herder, who worked around 1700. And it was nourished by people such as the Brothers Grimm, whose first part, uh, volume of the, uh, their tales was, came out in 1812. And all of this development had been going on throughout the uh, 19th century. By the late part of the century, the educated and the upper and middle classes in Europe and in North America had come to take it for granted that a country's unschooled rural inhabitants were in fact carriers of the remnants of an ancient culture. They all agreed, and this is just taken for granted. It was self-evident. The educated classes took it for granted that it was their duty to collect and revive all the arts and crafts that were about to be lost. This was often not even discussed. But also other ideas went into this preservationist mix in the late 1800s. The number of ideas came from thinkers and artists linked to the socialist arts and crafts movement, John Ruskin and uh, William Morris, who were interested in both the lesser art arts and in economic rehabilitation. These socialists, uh, the, the, the people did not find it at all difficult to put together their own conservative thinking with the thinking of the uh, British socialists. And important in Sweden were also writings by the Norwegian art historian Lawrence Dietrichson. And from now on, and for a long time, I will talk only about Sweden, or primarily about Sweden. But the Norwegian art historian Lawrence Dietrichson was very important and to him. Beauty was a moral force, and poor taste was a symptom of social and moral decline. There were wrote big books about this. And in addition, people were influenced by ideas by, for example, the yet controversial feminist Ellen Kay, who stated, artists were all and in order not to become slaves to drudgery, people must be taught to appreciate genuinely beautiful art. That's much about my introduction. Now, one of the Swedes who was swept away by the mix of ideas during the latter part of the 19th century was a conservative nationalist called Arthur Hasselius. His father, now, said at him for a long time, this is how he appears in the boardroom of his museum. His father was a military officer. He earned an advanced degree at Uppsala University in Nordic languages in 1860. He liked to call himself a doctor, but he really wasn't. <laughs> in the 1860s, he had taught in reformist Stockholm schools. And uh, like many other young idealists, he had spent his summer vacations walking extensively to get to know his country and its people. He even learned to weave. Um, in, and he walked particularly extensively in this particular Swedish province that you have seen pictures of before. Dala, uh, you have it here on the map of Sweden. And he walked all over. He married the daughter of uh, a Lutheran minister. She died in 1874, giving birth to a son. But for 10 years, husband and wife worked closely together. And it appears that the idea, they also collected lots and lots of objects, but it appears that the idea to create a museum, that was their joint one. Uh, and they, the first object, they wanted to put out in the museum, to exhibit in the museum, was a red woolen skirt. And I don't have a picture of it, but you can picture it. Um, now, in 1873, Hasselius opened the so-called Scandinavian ethnographic collections, which became the Nordiska Museum, the Nordic Museum. And this, oh. <coughs> 
is the bastion of the Nordic Museum. It is almost as big, I mean, get this one and think about it. It's almost as big as the Royal Castle. It's, uh, now, he did not, this building was not finished until he was dead, but he had planned it for a long time. He was formidable at charming people. He was charismatic. He got them to collect objects all over, and he paid absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> now, the great reformatory task that he had set before himself when he founded the Nordiska Museum and also his open air museum, Skansen, this is one of the earliest houses, since it was the first open air museum in the world. But the great reformatory task that he had set before himself when he founded these museums was spiritual and moral national awakening. I keep using words like that, but they were so they resound so much in the literature of the time. And he pronounced the traditions of the peasantry as the base upon which the cultural repertoires and the moral standards of the nation of Sweden as a whole were to rest. He also wished to show urban Swedes how rich and varied their country was. And he organized Skansen as a miniature of Sweden. You've been there, many of you, from, as a, uh, from north to south. But he also, he had musical performances at his museum, festivals. He wanted particularly Skansen to be a festive place for the nation. Uh, he created a, a following of uh, enthusiastic, they were called in those days, Hasilians, and they helped laying the foundation for a heritage canon of folk objects and customs. But he was also the butt of satire from many corners of Strindberg, or of Strindberg, and other intellectuals held that his creations, they were nothing but ridiculous fantasies, and why was he busy with this. Um, let me now turn to some of the other reformers, and a surprising number of them, of reformers, preservers, and entrepreneurs were women. I could name lots and lots of names. I will not do so. An important one was, who is on your pink sheet, Countess Sophie Leon Hubert Adler Sparre. <laughs> but get this, she founded on one hand the Association of Friends of Textile Art, which you have on your list, and a few years later she founded the Friedrika Bremer Association, the Friedrika Bremer Verbund, which to this day is a very important association in terms of gender questions and uh, women's question. And indeed, what she established, and so many other of the women established, were special links between textiles and women's rights. And these links are there to this day in uh, Sweden. But let me now say a few more words about at least two of the reformist women, whose name you are not going to find in any of the textbooks on ethnology. The first one is Lili Sikkerman, who is well known in certain circles, but not in academic ones. She lived between 1858 and 1949. She is, of course, on your pink sheet. She was the uh, owner for a long time of a needle workshop. And she, but then she received a scholarship to study at the South Kensington Museum in London, the lo museum that is now the Victorian Albert. In 1897, she exhibited some of her art at the Stockholm exhibition, but she was really taken with the peasant art that Hasselius exhibited there. And in 1899, she took the initiative to form Föreningen für Svensk Hemslöjd. I don't know if anybody here has heard the word Hemslöjd. It translates exactly into homecraft. The official name in, in English is the Swedish Handcraft Association. Still viable today. But at this woman, Sikkerman, single-handedly, she gathered together an executive board that was chaired by Prince Ilshev. Uh, he was an artist, 
but he was also the king's brother. He worked on the board until 1947 when he died. And the board included many other notables. And they, they were the ones who came up with the word hem, slave. So now you know <laughs> when it started. Um, now to seek him up, the important issue was to improve economic conditions, just as it has been to crafts movements in many parts of the world. She noted, as many others, that poverty had worsened in Sweden during the latter half of the 19th century, in part because of population increases. Many people left the countryside, she noted. Many joined a swelling urban proletariat, and what was really bad in her view, a lot of people left for the United States. And emigration was really a great concern among many intellectuals and politicians that were in Sweden at this time. They worried, as they did in other countries, that the best of Swedish stock was disappearing. And possibly they were right, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, Sigmund thought that Swedes were becoming so poor because they were really lazy and because they had absolutely nothing to do during the long, dark winters. And in fact, she thought that industrialization had made that even worse because now that you could buy things, you were even less willing than before to work with your hands. And so, to relieve idleness and poverty and emigration, she proposed, I mean, she she proposed a grandiose program uh, and her basic point that people had to be taught to reject cheap mass-produced goods and learn to make their own. But this wasn't enough. It wasn't enough just to learn to make things uh, or to copy peasant furniture and textiles. Her idea was that, uh, that it was important to improve all these things so that they could be sold to discriminating buyers. Uh, there she is in the lower left corner. Look at the woman in the middle of the group. This group was the first one that uh, managed one of the outlet shops that she opened in Stockholm from in 1899. The first one was open, and then a number of other shops were opened all over Sweden, all called Hemsred. Um, and But she was really, she was a formidable energy to solve practical problems, to get the right merchandise, to open up big exhibitions, and she called them pedagogical, centers. And what was really important to Sikkerman, apart from the economic issue, was that uh, uh, people learn to distinguish the well-made and the beautiful from the badly made and the ugly. And she never seems to have doubted her ability to make the proper distinctions between one and one. Uh, to her, the hierarchy of artifacts was self-evident. Highest up on the, on the hierarchy were peasant bobbin lakes. All over Europe at this time, there was a tremendous <coughs> revival in bobbin lace making in the part of English Midland and the Italian peasant lace. And then, very high up, were also these kinds of objects. Come on. Objects such as these uh, embroidered carriage cushions from southern Sweden in the 1830s and 40s. They were, I mean, this one I adore. Uh, look, well, you see what it all is about. And look there who is resting after <laughs> his great work of the past seven days. Creator. <laughs> oh, I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> and some of these carriage cushions she liked, this is called the cat man, uh, were also from, but this in Flemish weave. Um, also high up on the list were the molded splint boxes such as this one, painted. But then came the other things that she disapproved of. One of the things were rag rugs that had become popular in Sweden at this time. See, this is one of the many, many 
uh, folk life paintings of the time. The rag rugs were fairly new as an artist, and what she really disliked were these kinds of things, patchwork quilts. Uh, to her, they were a horror, and she went on and on in her writings about it, because what did people put into these uh, pieces? Uh, cut up pieces of homemade textiles, <coughs> uh, folk dress, uh, uh, cast off pieces of lace, they all went into these abominations. Uh, it is, I mean, of course, very interesting to reflect on that exactly the opposite happened in the United States. We all know uh, the crafts reform, to crafts reformers in this country, patchwork quilts epitomized female industry, thrift, and creativity. We can mention Murray Webster and uh, many others. But there was one thing that was even worse than patchwork <laughs> quilts uh, or rag rugs. At the very bottom of the hierarchy was crocheting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a good picture. They're the very antithesis of the fine art of bobbin lace making. And in one speech, she made this speech way up north, but she, in this one speech she noted that crochet is a truly weakening activity. One does not even have to sit to crochet, she noted. You could do it practically lying down. <laughs> <laughs> and work into which no concentration and no bodily and spiritual power has been invested. That kind of work is reprehensible, she noted. It has to be abolished. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> Sikkerman was outspoken and authoritarian. This is how she looked in her old days. <laughs> and uh, uh, she found herself in conflict with a lot of people. And in 1914, she left, left the di director of, of the Hemsley, uh, or the Swedish Handcraft Association. She turned to a, uh, she had co-founded the School of Weaving in southern Sweden. And she turned to making a gigantic inventory of traditional Swedish textiles. She, she and her brother took 25,000 pictures. She hand colored many of them. And uh, she published just one volume. And all the rest she donated to the Nordic Museum, along with about 1,000 pieces of handmade lace. Then she did something in 1970 that I think was fantastic. And there was a film, you could see it, this film, to this day. The, it is totally unique and it features folk artists and craftspeople at work. I have stills from this film here, but look at them. Uh, these are the old women in the Dalarna. Oh, you can't. Oh, I am blocking this one, am I? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> um, no, uh, and how they also show the young girls are indeed being able to learn bobbin lace making. But she, I mean, the film, is, it's an hour long. And these stills will just give you a little, uh, uh, this part. Can you see what this is about? The man and a woman knitting together. Uh, now, this is something for the but it's, it's a formidable thing that they, they used to work that way. Uh, this is it. So she had turned, Sikkiman turned, from agitation and reform to documentation. And that way, she contributed significantly to the stunning collections in, of textiles at the Nordic Museum. And she was really important in shaping a distinct aesthetic profile, the very same profile that after Hasselius strove to achieve. A lot has been written about Has after Hasselius as a precursor of ethnology, and next to nothing about her. What we read about her is solely as a part of the handcraft and homecraft association. It's even for two different worlds. Uh, but if little has been written about Sikkiman, Ethnology. Absolutely nothing has been written about another woman I want to uh, pick up. And it's been written about, she has been discussed in art historical circles, but not a word 
in any other way. Now, I'm talking about a lady called Utilia Adelborn. She's the one in the middle. She's here. She's portrayed with the two older sisters. In 1878 to 82, she attended the Royal Academy of Art, much against her mother's wishes. She came from a totally impoverished aristocratic family. What among her fellow students at the Royal Academy of Art was the great Anders Sorn, who was to become such a celebrated artist and social benefactor. She became best known as a, an illustrator and creator of children's books and several people have noted, well, she created the way a Swedish child should look. She was a good friend of Elsa Beskos, by the way. Her best known book is called, this comes from that book, it's called Pelle Snygg och barnen i snaskeby. That translated, the book was translated immediately into English as Clean Peter and the children of Grubby Lee. <laughs> No, you, you know what the moral point of the book is. Uh, but um, through her sisters, uh, Otilia Adelborg was also linked to the Friedrika Bremer Society and other reformist organizations. In fact, her sister Gertrude uh, was a managing director of the offices of the Friedrika Bremer Society. And she fought also as a conservative for women's right to vote. In 1899, Lily Zickerman invited Otilia Adelboy to join the board of the Swedish Handcraft Association. So Otilia became centrally placed. And to mark her new <coughs> dignity, she started keeping a diary, which is one of those semi-official diaries that many people kept in those days. Um, and, but she also, in her diary, knows that she she inherited, she always inherited money from some wealthy relative. So she took many long trips about 1900, among other places, to Italy. When she came home, her mother was very ill, and she nursed her mother for a long time. And when her mother passed away in 1903, Otilia wrote in her diary, she wrote this, it's my translation. My heart is full of gratitude. My grief almost gives way to my gratitude. Mother is no longer in pain. And I have my freedom. <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> and she asks, will I be able to use it constructively? And she was now 48 years old. And off she goes to her new freedom. And she decides to settle where? <coughs> Everybody knows? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is to this place called London. She'd been there before, and she had noted in earlier writing that in Gardner all is naive. There's a fairy tale style everywhere, <coughs> and the women in their starched lace hats and well, this is the fairy tale mood, and the women in their starched lace uh, uh, hats and poppy colored caps. They look like little round imps. She actually wrote troll. But Wagner and her, its people were magical to her. And a couple of years later, her sisters joined her in Wagner. Now you'd think that three unmarried elderly spin, aging spinsters would have a boring social life. Uh oh. <laughs> there was a stream of notables passing through their house, Anders Sorn and his wife Emma, who was born of the Jewish family Lam, the artist Karl and Karl Larsen, Prince Eugene, on and on, the art historian Jara Boetius, there is uh, Otilia in the very uh, first house uh, that she, but they were uh, there, uh, and there's the prince, here she is, who always took part in all the discussions, and Emma Lam Sorn. And there were many, many others. So Tilia all the boy and her sisters were part of, a, of an impressive network of intellectuals who were all enmeshed in efforts to rescue folk culture. But she also found time for herself. 
she walked around for hours drawing. The two projects were particularly important to her. The first one was, well, because of this, <laughs> in, in fact, uh, there were many funny f names for uh, handmade, uh, uh, bobbin lace in, in Dalala. One was Franz Masset, uh, the, the devil's uh, uh, lunchbox. There were lots of names. I mean, folk, uh, bobbin lace making was a living art, at least among some elderly persons. But in a few weeks after she settled in Dalarna. She started a school for bobbin lace making and she engaged an elderly woman to teach. This is a very unique photograph of the school she uh, ran in her first kitchen in uh, Gagnef. Uh, and as time went on, the pupils could instruct new pu pupils and the school went on, uh, continued this is here, pretty much to her death. Well, here she is in 1915. She learned to make bobbin lace together with her pupils. But the one of the interesting things with all of it is that many of the girls, and later on women, who took part, they actually learned a trade. They actually learned a profession this way because many of them were hired, for example, in Stockholm to teach bobbin lace making. I don't know if she even really thought about the fact that she had to train a number of women to be, get, have a profession. Now, her most gigantic project was another one, and that was what she called the Memory House, or Minas Stilgan, an open-air museum. And it's not one house. It is nowadays almost 25 houses. And she made a museum, just like Hacienis. In fact, this was one of the very first uh, local open-air museums in, in Sweden, so-called Hemlitzgorda, it's on your pink uh, sheet. There are about almost 100 in Dalarna today and more than 2,000 in Sweden as a whole. And of course, they are very, there she is, sorry. they are very important in today's community life, for example, in for midsummer celebrations. She had become a found, museum founder, just like after Hacelius. The holdings of that museum are stunning. She uh, cataloged about 2,500 objects, many textiles, but also other things. She drew them all. Um, but it seems that if she was almost driven by some kind of preordained preservationist agenda, because once the bobbin lace making school and the museum were in place, she returned to her art. And she, it made, she makes it very clear, she wrote three books while she was in Ghana, that she looked at people as real people. She had come to understand that peasants weren't only magical, but in her art, they did remain magical, many of them. She was particularly good at old people, and in children. I love that picture. Uh, and then, of course, this, what would you call this in English? Kick sled. Kick sled. Yeah, they were very common, of course, all over northern Sweden. But uh, Otilia, oh, the boy, she had a way of showing momentary excitement, momentary happiness. Look at those teeth. Uh, and, uh, uh, she could also point, uh, uh, think children were sad or dreaming or kind of overwhelmed by grown-ups. This was an early one by her, by a huge grown-ups next to, to them. The point with showing this is that these works have very little in common <coughs> with the stylized folk paintings where the peasants appear as sort of mannequins wearing folk dress or folk costumes. Oh, the boy comes close to her subjects and touches nerves. She communicates feelings in gay people. An unexpected death that would have been unthinkable among the, uh, among the folk, but in the, within the budding uh, field of folk life studies. So let me summarize a little bit. 
I nod to the end. <laughs> this is voluntary. <laughs> Despite their differences, Lily Sickerman and Ophelia Alderboy shared ways of thinking and reacting to the ideas and demands of the historical moment in which they live. They acted forcefully. They were actually entrepreneurs, creators, movers, and shakers. In any case, uh, they, this is she and her sisters and the other woman, the old age. They were not unobtrusive females dominated by men. They were two of the many women in the late 1800s who were now stepping out into public life, the phrase I have taken from the Swedish historian Eva Österberg. Convinced of the importance to preserve folk artifacts and the knowledge to make them, they were preoccupied with a sense of imminent cultural loss, just like so many others at this time of increasing industrialization. Um, now, as individual entrepreneurs, these women stood somewhat outside the uh, museums, the folk life museums that were being founded in the capital uh, at the same time as ideas all the time intersected. Um, but, just to repeat, while Hasselius museums, the Nordic Museum and Skansen, are regarded important precursors to an academic discipline of folk life studies, neither Sikkerman nor Adelborg are ever mentioned in similar contexts. Now, but let's go on and look a bit. I don't have that good pictures, but we'll look a bit inside Hasselius Museums, the Open Air Museum. We begin there. Skansen. Well, there he is again. <laughs> and <laughs> you can't just hate him. Um, we'll look behind the scenes of these two major institutions. So first, let's just look at Skansen. And if we were to arrive at Skansen in 1891, we would be met by women. Uh, and uh, uh, the men would be kind of in the background. They would be builders, carpenters, guards, and so on. The women who greet us would be Dal Kullur or Kullur, peasant women from Dalarna. You see the, the, the word on your face. <coughs> Let me detour a bit. Kullur in folk dress had long been familiar sight in Stockholm. Uh, they were migrant workers. Uh, I mentioned this at my last talk a few weeks ago. But in the, uh, for a long time, they operated the boats that scuttled between the islands of Stockholm. You see them there in the rhetoric costume. But they also worked in factories. This is a candle factory. They worked in other industrial establishments. They were poor migrant workers. Uh, most of them were dressed in the rhetoric dress. They weren't all from rhetoric, but uh, this was the most easily recognizable uh, uh, dress from Dalarna. And Hasselius hired them, as I said, at Skansen to sell tickets, to serve coffee, to work inside the houses, to demonstrate and uh, to well, demonstrate women's work in rural society, such as knitting and weaving. They lived on Skansen while they were employed there. In fact, could, they were employed at Skansen until the 1960s. Um, Hasselius also lived on Skansen, at Skansen, and so did his son Gunnar. He never remarried after his wife said. Um, and uh, Hasselius was always concerned with their reputation. One of the, his assistants, she was called an amanuensis, Sigrid Milrath, she wrote, he watched over them with fatherly attention, <laughs> making sure that they were properly supervised. And for a long time, one assistant, one of his assistants, his name is Hedda Bratt, these are all aristocratic names, I don't really recognize that. For a long time, another amanuensis supervised the color. They made sure that they, they did not stay out after 10 o'clock to make sure that they did not crochet. <laughs> <laughs> and to ascertain, like, 
<laughs> that their skirts were short enough. You heard me. <laughs> what it meant was that the Hasidic assistants were to uh, make sure that their skirts ended right above the ankles as the skirts of rural women ought to. Above all, the skirts must not sweep the floor. Oh, this is how the Kurdish lived in, outside of Stockholm. So, uh, yeah, I, I got a little bit behind it. They must ascertain that they did not wear skirts that swept the floor the way that high fashion prescribed. In other words, women and women's clothing play roles that were crucial to the success of such core enterprises as Skansen and also the Nordic Museum. Furthermore, and I hope you've noted that, uh, women's issues intersected with issues of social class and ethnicity. It was no accident that the color must not, under any circumstances, wear long skirts such as these women wear as a fundraiser at Skansen. Uh, but at the same token, yeah, the fundraiser took place right outside of the building. But by the same token, Hasselius prescribed that upper class ladies should from time to time dress up as peasant girls in his museums. Or in, on this picture, the woman to the, your very, to your very left is wearing some kind of Sami costume, costume from the Swedish minority living up uh, north, and uh, the others are wearing a mishmash of folk costume. <laughs> In other words, masquerading was a one-way affair. Upper-class women were encouraged to dress up as peasants or ethnic, but peasants could not dress up above their station. And uh, so that he Placidius Museum was intersected with class uh, questions. In fact, he thought that the upper class woman was the motherly ideal who would work side by side by the father, who was the, fa the fatherly man to create a true community. But if we move away from Skansen, which was lit outside of Stockholm on a peripheral island, and approach the center of Stockholm where Hasselius Museum, the Nordic Museum, was situated until 1907, was situated on the fashionable street of Drottninggata. Also, here Kuller were employed. I mean, they, he wrote it. They were very cheap. I mean, he, he didn't hesitate a second to write that. But we, if we move behind the, the exhibition rooms in, at Hasselius Museum, we'll be met only by women. In fact, in 1891, uh, there were 17 employees working with exhibitions, with research, and, uh, many, uh, and with maintaining the collections. 15 of the 17 were women. Uh, now, he did not hesitate for a bit to say that, yeah, they were cheaper. He didn't have to pay them as much as he had to pay the men. But several of the women were in, involved with research on a high level, and they were given the title amanuensis or assistant, and they kept it forever. Um, none of the women held an advanced academic degree, but neither did the men who were employed by Hasselius. But let me just briefly speak about one of the women. The women were very much concerned with textiles, and with studying customs uh, and uh, traditions, uh, oral traditions. The woman I want to mention, her name is Louise Hartberg. Now she lived between 1868 and 1944. She's on your pink sheet. She was hired in 1891 and worked at the museum until 1931 when she retired. Now she belonged to the learned elite. She spoke lots of languages. Her mother was a countess. And she participated in the International Council of Women. And she was an elected member of the Frederica Brenner Society. She had everything going for her. But she kept working on at the museum. In fact, she was 
it's very hard to know how she stood on women's issues because she was actually far more interested in her scholarship than in anything else. And she threw herself wholeheartedly to her tasks. What you see here is Hog died as a field worker. She did most of her field work in the winters when peasants were not at work and people had time to talk to her and to make conversation easier, she brought along a bag of candies and she would give that to the children so that she could interview the parents uh, <laughs> without being disturbed. She's the author of 50 scholarly articles, two big monographs, the most famous of them is 700 pages, when it translates to when death pays a visit, switch for customs and switch to be connected to death. She completed this in 1937, several years after her retirement. Now, uh, she had read voraciously in many languages, Edward Tyler, Max Miller, Willem Mannhardt, all the great scholars, but she really had the same idea of what she was doing as uh, Sikkerman and the other women, um, that the 11th hour has arrived and the remaining survivals of death beliefs have to be collected before it is too late. That is the main thesis of the book. But the book is crammed with uh, material. She gave papers about these matters all over Europe. Uh, well, she, she's very enigmatic in a lot of ways. It's <coughs> difficult to tell what she really thought about a lot of things. But, and this is, uh, as I said, she was part of the women's movement, but like so many other professional women of her time, she had begun to grasp the problems of gender inequality in terms of democratic participation. Yet, and I think this is very important, the norms of male authority and superiority seem to have been unquestioned givens in her uh, daily life. Now, if we had a lot of time, and it wasn't a special night, I would go on and on <laughs> portraying some of the other 15 women working for uh, Haselius, but I think I have made a point. Many women actively contributed to shaping the Swedish uh, folk uh, cultural sphere during the decades surrounding the turn of the century, 1900. They were inside as well as outside museums. They were poor color as well as highly educated aristocrats. Um, some were more entrepreneurial perhaps, such as Sigmund and Oliver, uh, but some seemed more willful than others. But uh, it, they undoubtedly helped laying a foundation to a future folk discipline, particularly with regards to textiles and customs. And what is really important here, by all accounts, they felt very much at ease doing this. They were not unhappy. They, they, the subjects of textiles and customs, they were regarded suitable for women. It was natural for women to be involved with museum holdings, with the visual arts, with textiles, with caring for museum, for archives and holdings. Um, somebody has said, well, it was, they, they were working just like a housewife would. I think that was a very facetious, I don't think at all they were, facetious comment. Let me just very briefly turn to the United States uh, and mention some of the women who were contemporaries or near contemporaries among North American folklorists and anthropologists. Now, there were great differences between, oh, I like this, yes, to <laughs> They, all the women, anthropologists and folklorists in the United States, they were trained primarily at Columbia by this man, Franz Boas, uh, who shaped North American anthropology. But his work was in many ways far more sophisticated than any work on cultural sciences in Europe. And he trained such American pioneers as Elsie Clues Parsons, 
independently wealthy here on her schooner in Malabar. Uh, she wrote some incredibly important works on the Southwest uh, 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 Native peoples of America. But there are also others. Of course, Ruth Benedict, who even made a postage stamp. And there was the great African-American author and uh, 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 folklorist Zora Neale Hurston. Now, women of their uh, intellectual capacity did not exist among the folk life scholars in Sweden. And I think, and, and this is why I wanted to bring this out, one reason for a certain intellectual depth and daring among the North American anthropologists and folklorists it is undoubtedly that they were educated in colleges such as Vassar, Barnard, and other colleges. Something comparable did not exist in Northern Europe. Very, very few Swedish women, for example, studied at university, certainly in, in the humanities, although it had been possible since 1873 for women in Sweden to study at the universities. Very few did. But in two respects, there was no difference between the Swedish women and their intellectually daring North American sisters. And that was in terms of pay and titles. <laughs> Elsie Clues Parsons taught at Columbia throughout her career. She never obtained tenure. Ruth Benedict was not appointed full professor until she was near her death, although she, she handled all the teaching of anthropology at Columbia. Margaret Mead, who have a portrait. She spent most of her working life at the Museum of Natural History. In fact, I met her there. And she was an associate curator, associate curator, Margaret Mead. Uh, and when, and this is what, when it came to professional recognition in the form of money and titles, female subservience was a given in North America as well as in Northern Europe. Now I'm going to talk with the speed of lightning. <laughs> but I want to return to Sweden and I'll speak extremely quickly about the years 1910 through 2010. I'll start this way. No, the, the year 1900 to 2010. In 1901, Arthur Hasiel <coughs> died unexpectedly. And the man who took over, his successor, he wanted to secure a more sustained economy, nothing wrong with that. He wanted to modernize the administration. He wanted to professionalize the entire uh, uh, operation. And he wanted to create a scientific institution and an academic discipline. And what did this mean? That meant bringing in men did not mean firing all these women who were assistants or amanuensis, but it meant the formation of a whole superstructure of men who now were bosses over the women, and they were given such titles as head curator uh, and other things. And the point is that professionalization meant masculinization. And parallel processes took place just about this time around 1910, in many areas and fields. We can just think of how the midwives were replaced by scientifically trained male doctors. In Swedish dairies, I mean, communities had dairies with cheese making and so on. They had been taken care of by women for a long time, maybe of course. But now they were replaced by men in shiny white suits. In fact, this is a... a <laughs> These processes of professionalization and masculinization occurred at a time when there was an increasing distinction made between what different kinds of knowledge, what was scientific knowledge and other kinds of knowledge. This was increasingly marked in the universities. And it was a given that it was the men who possessed the scientific knowledge, while women's knowledge was practical and emotional. And uh, in many contexts now, women's knowledge was accorded less value than, for, than in a convoluted way it had been given by romantic, such as Arthur Hazelius. 
what happened at this time was, in, in the, I have worked with some very uh, distinguished uh, historians of science on this. What it meant at this time was that the gap widened between scientific scholarly work on one side and other endeavors on the other side. And these developments became even more pronounced when the Nordic Museum was given a major endowment and could hire a professor. And uh, the first professor they hired was perhaps not such a great success, but, oh dear, wrong one, wrong professor. Here is Sebastian. They hired a man in 1934 called uh, Sigurd Eriksson. He, was, he worked all the way up to 1955. <coughs> And here you see him. He, he, he reformed the entire field. It became a field very close uh, to uh, cultural geography, uh, to uh, uh, other related field, uh, economic history, for example. Here he is on field work in his motor car, in the middle there, surrounded by his students. I often think of that motor car in contrast. It, against the uh, Louise Hart. That is, what, what, what did you call it? King sled. thank you. No king sled anymore. <laughs> and in fact, uh, uh, Ericsson's period, he was very influential in the government. His entire period has become called brilliant. He drew, attracted a lot of students to the field of ethnology and made it important in Sweden. I knew him fairly well. Uh, he, he was on lots of committees with the Mudals, for example, and other well-known people. Now, what did the new academic and scientific status of folk life research mean? Well, I don't want the speed of lightning, yeah, right? It took, it meant that it took many decades until one woman managed to break through and get a doctorate with uh, Sigurd Eriksson. Her name was Anna Mayanilin, and she got her doctorate in 1947. And she was one of my teachers. She continued, she's a stellar home, uh, textile uh, scholar. And what happened immediately? I liked her very much, but she had a terrible reputation. You've heard this one before. Um, she uh, was ruthless, she was said, inconsiderate. She got angry very easily. In other words, she had a volatile temper, temper, and these are negative qualities that are very often ascribed to women who achieve some kind of uh, position of uh, influence. So, but she never, she never <coughs> became full professor. We had to wait until 1973, the first woman in Sweden in Swedish ethnology was appointed for professor. This is a field that was really important. Uh, now, a lot of anecdotes about her too, but you may ask me about them later. I knew her very well. Uh, in 1980, another one was uh, appointed, and this was at a time when the field was really flourishing. And then nothing happened. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, the field was flourishing, but no woman was appointed full professor until the 1990s, the mid-1990s. Two of us were, I was, and my head spun around when I realized I was the fourth woman in this old field in the country to have been appointed full professor. And this is in a field that in Sweden was very big for a while. Uh, and then nothing happened, actually until 2000. Uh, and at that time, he knows there was a big reform making it possible for people to advance to full professorship on merit and not only just to sit and wait out someone who had died on the chair, which was the case before. And by now, 2000 to 2010, the field exploded. The majority of all the, women, uh, the leading women, the leading people in the field are women, and this went with the speed of lightning. That's where the speed of lightning is. <laughs> and it is really astounding. And not only that, since uh, 2001, the professor at the Nordic Museum is a woman. Her name is Birgitta Svensson. Yeah. 
Hello. And so is the director of the museum. Her name is Christina Masson, and she is a folk music scholar. But she and uh, Birgitta Svensson are very much aware of the need to care for enormous textile collections. But one could say that parallel to the masculinization of 1910, by 2010, there is a great process of femininization. Now, it's not easy to predict what this entails or will entail. I have lots of thoughts about it, but I'm not going to offer them. By all accounts, the many women who now hold leadership positions are engaging in and will even more engage in reform, revision, redress, repositioning, just like their sisters did, some of them, 100 years ago. Now, to conclude, I'd like to say this. I hope I have shown that lots of women <laughs> helped out in shaping a Swedish field of folk life studies in the 1800s. I also think I have shown, at least some of you have not, but I think I'm sure of myself, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that a process of masculinization set in around 1910, and that we are now undergoing a process of femininization. And in any case, I am certain I have demonstrated that women's rise to position of influence has certainly not been a straight line of progression upwards and forwards. On the contrary, we are talking about a pretty bumpy road going back and forth, uh, a bumpy road through the decades and centuries.